Hi, it's Internet Grandpa here. We're going to continue reading Carry On Mr. Bowditch. If you remember, the uh, Mr. Bowditch was now the captain of the ship and uh, they had sailed into a harbor in the East Indies somewhere. I can't remember where now, a Sumat in Sumatra. And uh, the dado wasn't, uh, wasn't providing peppers for them to load or pepper rather, and uh, he kept kept asking for a little more money so they could go higher in line or things like that. And Nate kept saying, no, we'll wait. So the last time, the dado was more polite. Pepper was coming in more and more slowly, he said. He feared the crop was running low. Perhaps if the captain of the Putnam could advance a small sum, say a thousand or so silver dollars, then the dado could urge his men to greater effort Nate said he'd wait. The dado sighed and fingered his crease. Remember the crease is the long curvy uh, knife. That night, Nate could not sleep. He went topside to pace the deck. Somewhere he heard a snore. He went forward. Corey was on watch, was sleeping. Nate spoke quietly. Corey, Corey. His voice brought old Chad running up the hatchway. What's wrong, Captain, is he hurt? Chad's voice cracked. Is, is he dead? Corey started and mumbled. What? What? Aye, aye, sir. Chad roared. You? Asleep on your watch? The tongue lashing he gave his brat grandson brought the whole crew topside. What was it, they asked. Had the Malays tried to board? If they had, Nate roared, you'd all be dead in your sleep. He turned on his heel and went aft. There was nothing he needed to say to Corey. There was nothing he could say to the heartbroken old man who was Corey's grandfather. Well, Grandpa was kind of sad because his son, his grandson fell asleep on watch. That's an important, important duty to stay on watch, especially when you're in dangerous waters. Young boys don't always understand that, but old men do. More days crawled by. At last, the dado said he would have pepper for the Putnam tomorrow. The next morning, Nate gave Mr. Denny his orders. He was to begin unloading ballast so he could store pepper. He was not, under any condition, to let more than two melees on board ship at one time. Nate took Loopy ashore with him. The boat crew handled, hand, landed the scales and a money chest and carried them to the square. The boat returned to the Putnam. Lupe and Nate were alone in a swarm of bandy-legged, barrel-chested, powerful brown men. More and more men swarmed into the square with their baskets of pepper to be weighed and stored in bags. Finally, the pepper bags made a wall shoulder high. If the captain would pay now, the dado said, the men would be taking the pepper to the ship. The price was $12 per picule. Nate did not hesitate. He slammed down the lid on the money chest. Mr. Sanchez, call a boat for us. We'll get Pepper somewhere else. Lupe's smile stretched. His eyes were flat, black, and watchful. He prowled from the square and left Nate alone in the swarm of melees. Two minutes passed, three and five. More brown men thronged into the square. A violent argument rose. Nate wished he had had a grammar and dictionary of their language, too. It might have helped to know what they were saying. At last, the dado approached him, smiling his hand on his crease. It had been a very hard work, he said, but he had persuaded the men to give up their pepper at $11 a pick tool. The men were sad. It was choice pepper, the best of the season. That much was true, Nate knew. When the pepper began ripening in January, it ripened on the lower branches first. Not until May were the men harvesting the best of the crop. $11 a pick tool. Nate opened the money chest again. When Loopy returned, the Malays were shouldering the pepper bags and hurrying to the water's edge, loading their prowess, P-R-O-A-S. I'm not sure what that word means. You're going to have to look it up. P-R-O-A-S, loading their prowess. I don't know if that's like small boats or what. Lupe smiled again, and this time the grin reached his eyes. Senor, he drawled, you are quite a guy. Nate and Loopy went to the beach and watched the boats speed toward the Putnam. 10 boats, more than 50 men. As they watched, a ladder dangled from the Putnam. Instantly, a dozen melees were laying hold, ready to climb. They could hear the angry shouts. 
Then they saw Denny, Watson, and Jensen appear at the rail with muskets. The melees edged back. Two went on the board. Nate and Lupe returned to the square to buy more pepper. The next day, the dado was sad. He, why couldn't his men help on the Putnam? They would save the white men much work at storing the cargo. Lupe explained with his mirthless, mirthless smile and his watching eyes. He explained. Their captain, he said, was a harsh man. He liked to work his crew hard. Also, he murmured to Nate, why do our own work? We live longer, eh? Also, he murmured to Nate, we do our own work. We live longer, eh? So they were worried that the Malays might, uh, might kill them and take their ship, I suppose, and any money left over in their chest. June passed and half of July. More ships anchored at Tully Pass. One morning when Nate went ashore, the dado spread his hands and sighed. The 200 picules he had promised for today, it would be impossible to get. I wonder, Lupe muttered, how much who is paying for Pepper? Now what? Do we wait him out again? Nate smiled. No, we don't wait him out. We sail. We'll complete our cargo with coffee at the Isle of Bourbon or the Isle of France. He told Lupe of the two French islands, islands east of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. I made my first sea voyage to Bourbon, he said. How long ago it seemed. When they reached the Isle of France, three ships of Salem and Beverly were there. Polly's father, Captain Ingersoll, was just ready to weigh anchor. He came aboard the Putnam to see Nate get news to take home to Polly. How was it in Sumatra? Any trouble? Oh, no, Nate told him. Quite uneventful. Lupe's grin spread. Captain Bowditch, he is one guy. <laughs> Captain Ingersoll cocked his head to one side. So nothing happened, eh? I see. Well, I'll tell Polly all is well and to look for you soon after I arrive. I shouldn't take you, it shouldn't take you more than a week to load coffee here. They cheered Captain Ingersoll on his way. Nate said, Mr. Denny, call the men aft. Soon his men stood facing their captain, a tired crew. Haggard with the long months of heat and the grinding toil of the passage to the Isle of France, he knew that every man standing there wanted at least a week on shore before they sailed. He said, Captain Ingersoll tells me there's plenty of coffee to complete our cargo. Then, when we've wooded, watered, and provisioned, we'll weigh anchor. And we won't wet that anchor again until Salem Harbor. Do we bear a hand? They split the air with cheers. In five days, the Putnam stood out from the island. When Nate had taken his departure, he did some figuring. It had taken E. Henry 11 weeks from Bourbon to Salem. The Putnam was faster. With luck, they'd be home in early November, maybe even the last of October. They ran into a storm that night. For days, they lived in wet clothes and ate cold food. The Putnam was rolling much too heavily for the cook to make fire in the galley. They doubled the cape and found headwinds. No speed from the Putnam now. She seemed to crawl. With a fair wind abaft the beam, the ship could have logged 150 miles in a day sailing. Now they fought headwinds from tack to tack, and some days sailing did not take her 15 miles nearer to home. Tack to tack, when they sail into the wind, they have to tack, they have to go back and forth. And the sails kind of form like a shape, like a wing on an airplane, and they get lift the same as an airplane wing does, and that lift actually moves them forward against the wind. It's really strange. When the storms were over, Lupe said, we make up for it now, eh? But the storms were never over. Several days at a time, Nate was not able to take a sight. October passed. November came. With luck, Nate told himself, they'd be home by early December. With good luck, he added. In December, they reached the roaring forties of the North Atlantic and groped their way, closed hauled in the teeth of the gales. At last, the storm subsided. All kinds of bad things can still happen. We'll see. At six bells of a forenoon watch, Nate said, Mr. Denny, heave two for soundings. Watson carried the deep sea lead forward and the other men followed, each with the fakes of the line coiled in their hand. Colin on the cat head, Sandy on the fore chains, and Jensen on the mid chains. Mr. Denny was on the quarter deck with the rest of the line coiled. Denny sang out, All ready there, forward! Watson bellowed, Aye, aye, sir! Heave! 
Watch ho, watch. It was Collins on the cat head. Watch ho, watch. From Sandy to the four chain. Watch ho, watch. It was Jensen on the main chains. Mr. Denny sang out, 60 fathoms. They hauled in the lead. Nate checked it. Black mud. They were off Block Island. Block Island, Loopy grinned. Next door on home. The storm is dying. But the storm raged again, and though it had been gathering its strength for more, one more assault, as though it had been gathering its strength for one more assault on the Putnam. Long days passed. The 15th of December, when they sounded, the lead brought up sand. Off Nantucket, Loopy said. I dressed in my go ashore clothes. Then the stormy North Atlantic proved that all the other gales had been mere child's play. For seven days and nights, the Putnam was deluged and hammered. At last, the skies cleared. Nate made his observation. I could have swum from Nantucket that fast, he muttered. Clouds darkened the sky again. For three days, the rain poured in the waterfall torrents of the tropical storms. Only the rain, this rain was cold and mixed with sleet, and men struggled with numb fingers to reef and loose sail. In his cabin, Nate rested his head on his hands. He had hoped to be home in early November, with luck the end of October, Christmas Eve, and they weren't home yet. Something clawed at his attention. He looked around, puzzled, then realized what it was. The wild roaring, roaring and pitching, rolling and pitching of the Putnam had lessened. At eight bells, Mr. Denny came to his cabin. The rain's letting up, Nate asked. The rain's letting up, Nate asked. Aye, aye, sir, Mr. Denny was grim. This is worse. Worse? Yes, sir, fog. He shook his head slowly from side to side. I've seen fogs in my days, but this one. He shrugged, and his shrug was a shriver, shiver, fog. So fog's bad news for those guys on those old sailing ships. Cause they can wreck on rocks. So close to home. Will they make it? Well, that was the end of chapter 23. And remember, chapter 23 was called Captain Bowditch Commanding. Next time, we'll read chapter 24. It's titled Man Against the Fog. Think they'll make it home? It's a good story. I hope you're enjoying it. Love you guys. Bye-bye for now. Oh, remember, like, subscribe. Share it with your friends. Bye-bye.